thank you. <coughs> About no restarting. Um, uh, the only problem is um, I don't know know very much about you and uh, about this group of languages yet. We are just uh, in the process of initiating a research project about Nuristani languages at the University of Cologne. So I will talk about what we would like to know about the Nuristani languages, provide some background information about them, and uh, especially I would like to talk about the problems with affiliating the Nuristani languages within, with, um, with the situating the Nuristani languages within the Indo-Iranian group of languages. So the structure of the talk is very, uh, will be the following. I will first speak about the geography, where the languages are spoken, and also provide some background information about the speakers. Uh, then I will talk about the Indo-Iranian branch of Indo-European, and will become apparent while why this is ne necessary. Uh, I will say some words about how we discriminate between Indo-Aryan and Iranian within Indo-Iranian and sketch the situation at the Hindu Kush, in the Hindu Kush region now. Uh, then I will turn to the Nuristani new, new languages themselves and introduce some interesting features of the Nuristani languages and uh, subsequently, I will try to situate the Nuristani languages within Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Indo-Iranian and uh, try to uh, introduce how we are going to proceed at the University of Cologne in the years to come. Uh, this will be the last point. So, geography. The Nuristani languages are spoken in just one province of Afghanistan and in just one valley in Pakistan, near the border to Afghanistan. Here you see the map of Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush region. The circle, the insert region, is roughly, corresponds roughly to the province of Nuristan, which, has to be, which uh, was previously called Kafiristan, because it was inhabited by tribes who had a special tribal religion until the end of the 19th century. But this religion encouraged people living in what is now Nuristan to um, live in a state of, in a permanent war against any other tribe, any tribe with a different religion to um, kill people, to steal cattle, to um, make slaves and so on. So, in, at the, um, In the years 1895 um, and 96, the region was conquered by uh, the government of Kabul in a war and stopped the unpleasant activities. You see how the region is geographically formed. Nuristani languages are spoken by tribes living in river valleys cut by rivers into the mountain. We have only five of them. The language names are Kati, Prasun, Vaigali and Ashkun. And the languages are spoken by some 30,000 persons or were spoken by some 30,000 persons which was found out by a German expedition in the year 1935 but later estimations confirm the numbers of speakers for the 60s and 70s, for the time of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. We have some 20,000 speakers of Kati, some 2,000 speakers of Prasun, then some 5,000 speakers of Vaigali and 7,000 Ashkuns. The social linguistic situation is very different. Kati is a kind of lingua franca of region, and for this reason, Kati, some Kati is usually learned by Prasun and Waigali, less by Ashkun. Um, Prasun is not learned by anyone living outside the Prasun Valley, and so Waigali is also, also, also uh, not learned by speakers of Kati and so on. The Nuristani languages are surrounded by Indo-Iranian languages. Uh, 
now I lost my map, sorry. I have to... Sorry, I cannot locate my map. Uh -huh. Now, this is a map made by a linguist, by an American linguist, who used to live for some two, uh, 20 years in the vicinity. Uh, the colored regions are the habitats of the Nuristani languages. So the blue region here and here, this is Kati, then in between is Prasun. The green region is Vaigali and this here is Ashkun. I also posited, posited uh, I also um, the stars are representing Indo-Aryan languages spoken in the region and the half moons Iranian languages. Here Munji and Vohi in the Badakhshan and here is Pashto which is spreading for some two generations in the region. So we see the Nuristani languages are surrounded by Indo-Iranian languages and they are generally also believed to belong to Indo-Iranian too. So the next point which has to be addressed is what is the Indo-Iranian? What are the Indo-Iranian languages? Indo-Iranian is actually a branch of Indo-European. They are related to Italic, Celtic, Germanic, Hellenic and so on. And Indo-Iranian languages consist of two sub-branches. The Indo-Aryan branch, which is represented basically by Sanskrit, which is attested since late 13th century before Common Era, and Iranian languages, Avestan and Old Persian, the attestation starts a little bit later. Why do we actually believe that Indo-Iranian languages are related to Celtic, Latin, Greek and so on? We have actually two criteria to establish this. We have numerous matches with Greek, Latin, Celtic and so on in the lexicon, and we also have inflection patterns which are very similar to those found in the Indo-European languages spoken in Europe. If you use a handbook, you would probably first find um, for the lexicon something like given in 2a, viras in Sanskrit, viras in Lithuanian. I just took Lithuanian, but I could easily have taken a different language or a variety of languages spoken in Europe, such as Old Irish and Greek and Latin and so on. Um, and then we have ghost or god, sweet wine, wool, otter and cereal and so on. Um, but lexemes with designating such concepts as man and are usually not very significant for establishing genetic relations between languages because they are easily borrowed. Consider, for instance, nearly the same or partly the same lexemes in a language which is usually not considered to belong to Indo-European at all. It's a Uralic language which is called Komi and spoken at the Uralic um, mountains as a member of the Uralic family. You see we also have some matches between Sanskrit and Komi uh, in lexeme such as martas, mort, man, human, and so on. More significant for establishing that Indo-Iranian is actually an Indo-European branch of languages are etymological matches in words with more abstract meanings such as pronouns, local and temporal adverbs, and here we find plenty of evidence which is pretty unequivocal. But then we also have grammatic uh, we al also have inflectional similarities between the Iranian and um, the other Indo-European languages spoken all over the old board, world. For instance, uh, such as given in 3a, it's a part of the inflection of the verb to be in Sanskrit, Yanka Western, one of the most ancient Iranian languages, and Old Latin and Gothic you see the inflection functions very similarly and we have clear matches in the 
suffixes used in the different languages, but also in the personal indexes and verbs, such as T in Sanskrit, T in Younger Western, and T in Latin, T in Gothic, and also in the overall structure of the paradigm, we can clearly see that, for instance, in the indicative mood, in the singular, we have the root consisting of a vowel and an S, in Sanskrit, also in Younger Western, and Old Latin, and in Gothic. In the optative mood, we have, by contrast, the root morpheme consisting of just the consonant, the vowel is not here. In the subjunctive mood, the vowel appears again, and we have this in Sanskrit, again in Sanskrit, the other version, but also on, in Old Latin and Gothic and so on. But this means that Indo-Iranian languages clearly belong to the Indo-European language family. Indo-Iranian languages constitute a separate branch of Indo-European because of, again, non-trivial, uh, because of some innovations in them. We have non-trivial phonological innovations and we have exclusive morphological innovations. For the phonology, the most salient innovation is probably the merger of the liquids R and U in Proto-Indo-Iranian R. We see Lithuanian is clearly distinguishing between two uh, liquids and Sanskrit or the Western do not. A more interesting innovation is the merger of A, E, O, which are distinguished by the languages of Europe, such as Greek, in Proto-Indo-Iranian plain A, but the short O turns out as long A in oval medial syllables. It's a very characteristic uh, innovation of Indo-Iranian. As for morphological innovation, we can consider the innovation given in five. It's a special form of middle voice, second singular imperative, based of the active voice, second singular imperative, recently univerbated with a pronoun, with a so-called Indo-European reflex re reflexive pronoun in the uh, accusative singular. So we have uh, a secondary imperative, something like carry yourself, based of yourself, uh, on yourself and caring. How do we distinguish between the two sub-branches of Indo-Iranian, between Indo-Aryan and Iranian? We also use phonological innovations such as A, the loss of aspirated stops in Proto-Iranian and B, the development of Proto-Indo-European S into H, when not preceded or followed by a stop. Here we can see in Sanskrit two series of stops, of voiced stops are distinguished, plain voice stops and aspirated voice stops. This contrast is lost in a Western and Old Persian in the Iranian languages. Similarly, the S, when followed by a vowel, is preserved in Sanskrit, but turned into H in Younger Western, Inner Western and Old Persian. Now we have to make a jump for approximately three millennia, because we don't have old text from the Hindukush region. In the region of Hindukush, we only found languages attested since late 19th century, which means roughly three millennia later than Sanskrit and Avestan and so on. And this makes distinguishing between, old Ira between Iranian and Indo-Aryan a little bit more trick uh, a little bit trickier. Here we see a range of Indo-Aryan languages, which means basically descendants of Sanskrit. And if we compare the voiced stops in Sanskrit with their reflexes, for instance in Pashai, we see that basically nothing happened, 
but in some of the languages the distinction, the contrast is secondarily abundant. This must be a very recent development, but nevertheless we cannot use this feature for distinguishing Indo-Aryan from Iranian in the Hindu Kush region uh, as far as the situation today is concerned. The second feature, the development of Proto-Indo-Iranian S into H in Iranian languages can be used, we see, in, in the Aryan languages spoken, in the descendants of Sanskrit spoken in the region, nothing happened to the inherited S. As I said, we also find some ir clearly Iranian languages in the region, and um, what is nice about them, that they have experienced some more innovations which make them easily detectable. It is actually an easy task to distinguish Rahi, an Iranian language, well, from, for instance, Pashai, which is a descendant of Sanskrit in the Hindu Kush area. Now, what is the position of the Nuristani languages within Indo-Iranian or within Indo-European? Before we can talk about this, I would like just to give a little more information about what we actually know about the Nuristani languages. We don't know very much, because it is very difficult to make research into Nuristani for political circumstances. At the moment, field work is out of the question, it is too dangerous there. We just have a grammar of one Kati dialect written by a Russian linguist Grunberg and published in 1980. We have a collection of texts for Prasun and the grammatical sketch written by Budras and Degeno and based on field work by Georg Budras during the 50s and 70s in Afghanistan. For Vaigali, we just have a grammar of just one subdialect of the Kalashum dialect of Vaigali, written by Degeno, which is also based on field notes by Budrus. And for Ashkun, the last Nuristani language, we just have a grammatical sketch and some, um, um, some recorded text and also a little bit, um, uh, uh, also some. Uh, also a word list by Georg Morgenstiernier, who made research into the Nuristan languages during the 20s and 30s. So not very much. Now, what we know for sure about the Nuristani languages is that these languages belong to Indo-European. We know this again because of the lexicon and because of the grammar. Here is just some lexemes from Sanskrit and their counterparts in West Kati, Kalashum Vaigali and in Prasum. As for the grammar, it is still possible to detect some very archaic features in the Nuristan languages, for instance, the well-known in the European suppletion in the inflection of the demonstrative pronoun. It is still found in a dialect of Vaigali, just approximately in the same form it is found in Sanskrit and in Gothic, a Germanic language and in Greek. And traces of this system are found in Prasun, which is a, a different Nuristani language. So we know for sure Nuristani languages belong to Indo-European. What is our reason to believe that Nuristani languages constitute a unit? Geographically, they look like a unit, but we actually don't know this. We assume this because of some similarities in grammar, and we assume this because of the peculiar reflexes of a uh, series of of consonant phonemes of stops, um, of Proto-Indo-European stops in Uristani. First, for the grammar, here is the inflection of just one verb, to eat, in West Kati and Kalashumbaigali. 
you see the inflection is a little bit unusual. We have to distinguish between two um, genders. We have different forms for masculine, uh, for the masculine gender and feminine. In West Carti, the distinction is encoded by the palatalization in the feminine form, the palatalization of the suffix le, and we have just the same in Kati Vaigali, where the palatalization of the feminine gender is actually not, cannot be directly observed, but we see it's um, the palatalization of the following uh, vowel. So, this system is actually uh, the inflected forms of the future tense in uh, West Kati and uh, Kalashum Vaigali are actually a combination of uh, the verbal noun, an agent noun, eater, one who eats, or eating in Kati, a copula which is preserved in West Kati but has been abandoned in Vaigali. So between several languages you find a very clear uh, uh, several Nuristani languages share very clear innovations in the morphology and the other reason yeah. uh, this is a typological parallel for the development of um, taken from Sanskrit an ancient noun combined with synclitic copula yields future tense. The other reason to believe that Muristani languages probably constitute a branch, uh, a group of closely related languages is the development of is the situation with the palatal tectals in the Nuristani languages. Proto-Indo-European possessed a series of stops which are not preserved as such in any language but have to be reconstructed because of the reflexes in the individual languages, the so-called palatal tectals, k, g, and g, with aspiration. We see in Greek that these phonemes are reflected just as plain velo stops, but in many languages they turned secondarily into affricates and subsequently into fricatives, such as in Sanskrit and Avestan. We see the palatal k, in Sanskrit, the reflex is sh, in a Western s. For the palatal g, the reflex is in Sanskrit, the affricate j, and in a Western, the fricative z, and so on. In detail, we can see what we have to reconstruct for the immediate prehistory of Sanskrit. We have to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct a series of affricates as a ch, j, and j. And for the Iranian languages, for Proto-Iranian, we have to reconstruct similar affricates, tz, dz, and dz. Now, what is so interesting about the Nuristani languages is the following. As it seems, Nuristani cannot descend from Sanskrit and cannot descend from Iranian, but they preserve the Africans roughly in the same way they are reconstructed for the Proto-Iranian. So the Proto-Indo-European palatal k is reflected as an affricate tz in Kati and Waigali, spelled differently but the pronunciation is the same. The Proto-Indo-European palatalized g is reflected as affricate tz in West Kati and subsequently developed into Z in Vaigali, and so on. We see a clear contrast to Sanskrit and also to languages descending from Sanskrit, such as Shina and Pashai, the so-called Dadic languages, descendants of Sanskrit spoken in the Hindu Kush region. Strangely enough, we also find other ret reflexes of Proto-Indo-European palatal tectals in Nuristani, such as sh, which is more similar to Sanskrit sh, and nearly the same we find, for instance, in Pashai reflexes of Sanskrit words, such as shala, 
Chol in Pashai, but this, these words may, might um, easily be recent borrowings from uh, the so-called Dardic languages, which means descendants of Sanskrit. Now, what does it tell us about the position of Nuristani within Indo-Iranian? We now understand that Nuristani languages cannot belong to the Indo-Aryan sub-branch of Indo-Iranian. They also cannot descend from Proto-Iranian because, because S is preserved in them. But if Nuristani is neither Indo-Aryan nor Iranian, it must constitute a separate sub-branch of Indo-Iranian. This is a conclusion which is usually drawn in the literature, but we know for sure that Nuristani is Indo-European because of the evidence provided by the inflection. But do we actually know that Nuristani languages participated in the Proto-Indo-Iranian innovations, such as the merger of R and L and the merger of R, E, O into R. If we don't know this, why not to assume that we are dealing with a different branch of Indo-European? The Indo-Iranian languages are not the only languages which turned the proto indo not only languages in which the Proto-Indo-European palatal tactiles turned into Africates. We also have such languages as Lithuanian, as the Baltic languages, and also Russian and so Slavic languages, and so on. It is even possible to play with this idea and to try to compare the Nuristani languages, for instance, with Slavonic. We already um, had a look at the future tense in West Kati and uh, Kalashun Vaigali. Now we have a very similar construction <laughs> in some Slavonic language, in all of Slavonic. Uh, the semantics is a little bit different. We have a present, we have a resultative perfect, but it is made out of a result uh, out of a noun with the same or nearly the same uh, suffix and so on. Uh, the difference in the semantic can be bridged if we um, pay attention to the lexicalized L formations in Slavonic. So why don't we assume that the Nuristani languages are actually a subdialect of Slavonic? I don't know. Um, I certainly don't believe that. But I think the task for the future would be first to extend our knowledge of Nuristani languages and dialects by systematically collecting and describing the evidence, especially for those dialects which have not been yet systematically investigated. And the second point, we would try, uh, what we are going to what we would like to start in at the University of Cologne is to develop a Nuristani historical phonology and morphology step by step by comparing dialects of Nuristani languages with other dialects of Nuristani languages and so on. And this seems to be very promising because of, first, why do we need more information about Nuristani? Have a look at this at the reflection uh, at the present tense reflection of to do in Kati in Western Kati kunum konish koni in Eastern Kati kutum kotish koti. We don't know very much about Eastern Kati. What is it? Is it a different suffix? Is it a sound change turning and into t? It's very difficult to believe this within one and the same Nuristani language. So we have to collect more information and. If this is done, uh, then we can learn more about the immediate prehistory, about the more recent sound changes which must have been operative in the Nuristani languages and to understand a little bit more about them and about the configuration of the Nuristani language group. For instance, we already know that the Afrikaans in Kati and uh, Kalashongwaigali 
has the counterpart uh, has as the counterpart in Ashkun. This helps to understand a very strange situation with some lexemes. In Kati and Waigali we have a retroflex affricate ch. It is corresponding to Ashkun str. What is it? But if we consider that in Ashkun the affricate ts preserved in Proto-Nuristani turned into S, we understand the situation. Proto-Nuristani ts seem to have developed into a retroflex Africa ch in Kati, Vaigali, and proto prasun but not in Ashkun. In Ashkun we have an intrusive t between s and r. This means that we have a sound change shared by Western Kati, Kati Vaigali and Prasun, but not shared by Ashkun. It's spectacular, because until very recently everybody believed that Prasun constitutes some sub-branch of Nuristani, whereas all the other Nuristani languages have to be grouped together. So we are going to do it step by step and collect information about the most recent prehistory of the languages to be able to make informed guesses about their more remote prehistory and someday understand more about their position within Indo-Iranian and Indo-European. Thank you.